Well, uh, we're here at Napier University, and uh, thank you very much, Sugata Mitra, for, for agreeing to, to meet and have a conversation about uh, yourself, education, and uh, what you've been doing. Yeah, happy to be here. <laughs> Superb. Well, um, I'd like to start <laughs> with uh, uh, finding out a little, a little summary for people who haven't... Uh, heard of, of your work. Uh, uh, could, you, could you tell people a little yeah. about yourself? It's an yeah, well, I, uh, I work in uh, Newcastle University and I'm a professor of educational technology there for the last about nine years uh, as of 2014. But uh, yeah. before that, I used to live in India and the work, uh, my more recent work, amongst many other things, is with children's education, um, which started off with uh, children in India about 15 years ago. And these were the years when, uh, in the 90s, when uh, the internet was just about becoming popular. You know, it had been around for a while, but it was more inside the corporate world and so on and so forth, or inside rich people's homes. and. It was just beginning to come out. So at that point in time, the experiment was considered uh, unusual in the sense that I thought that I would take this technology and bring it to uh, children who have nothing at all, you know, slum children or village children who are really very far away from that world um, in order to see what they do with it. And also to answer the question that uh, uh, do they need teachers who would explain the whole thing to them, computers and the internet, before they could actually make use of it. Um, of course, it's now very well known that you don't need any such thing. But in those days, it was not known. It, in fact, the reverse uh, was considered true, that you needed to actually go to a computer school to learn how to use computers. And I was able to disprove that uh, very rapidly in, uh, in 1999 through this experiment called the hole in the wall, uh, mainly called that because it consisted of sticking computers into walls anywhere and just leaving them uh, there with uh, broadband, in those days, broadband internet on them with no restrictions and was able to show that uh, that we don't need to teach anything about how to use a computer. And as a matter of fact, those computer classes then stopped all around the world. Um, but uh, now, it doesn't sound like a big deal today, but those were the times when the internet was just about becoming popular with the middle classes and, and not just restricted to corporates and uh, you know rich people. Um, I took it down to the villages and the slums uh, to see whether children need an introduction to all of this, this whole new world, um, and if so, what kind of an introduction. What I found was that they didn't need an introduction. Now, that's very well known today. wasn't known then that groups of children can learn to operate computers and use the internet by themselves. What was uh, not known then also, and which continues to be a mystery today, is that they can do this without knowing any English. So it's still a mystery how they manage to navigate the English internet without knowing English. If you ask them, they complain about it. And they say, well, you've given us a, a machine that works only in English. So obviously we had to teach ourselves English in order to use it. But how exactly this teaching of English happens, I have no idea. It's not, it's not good English. It's very crude, usable English. But they do pick it up. Um, now, that's not a surprise anymore because two and a half year olds are teaching themselves to read using phones and ta tablets and so on. But it was completely unknown at that time and almost unbelievable for people. But what happened next was uh, still more unbelievable, which is that, so what? Once they do learn how to use the computer and the internet, what do they do? Well, they play games all the time, which is, you would expect. But... There is a interesting thing about public use of computers. If you have one big screen, and you have lots of children, very quickly there is disagreement about what game to play and uh, so on. Uh, they do come to a consensus 
every now and then, but quickly the whole activity of game playing reduces and is replaced by, surprisingly, searching. Once they realize that they can type in things into the computer and the computer always has something to say about it, they start using the internet to do all kinds of things, to find out things they're curious about, more importantly, they type their homework assignments into it, and then they copy down what the internet has to say, which used to trouble me a great deal, because I used to think, God, this is terrible. I mean, what is this going to do to education? And uh, I was very foolish, because it took me 10 years to realize something that was quite obvious, that the internet throws everything at the children. How is it that they're able to copy only the parts that are relevant to them? which they always invariably do. How did they understand? Um, well, one thing led to the other. I came to England and I brought this whole thing, this whole body of what I had learned with me. Um, you cannot do this experiment in England because you would get frozen children because of the weather. So, <laughs> so or anywhere in the UK for that matter. So I had to turn it upside down. What I did was I converted classrooms into this kind of open access, which in India, by the way, is called the hole in the wall experiment, because these computers were sort of embedded into walls. Um, you can do that inside a classroom quite easily by emptying the furniture out, putting a couple of computers in and letting lots of children inside. Um, children who are used to all kinds of devices. So the first thing they say is, but why are there only two computers? Well, you have to say, well, it's a game. I mean, that's how it is. And then the hole in the wall happens. They start grouping together and they very quickly go through the same phases that I saw in India of uh, quarreling about games, moving on to searching. And then suddenly this capability to answer really difficult questions. They think it's almost like a game. If you tell them, you know what? Um, uh, there is a word called quantum entanglement and it's only understood by really big people and really clever people. Do you want to take a look at what this is all about? And nine-year-olds, in their own way, in about 30 minutes, will start to explain to you what quantum entanglement is. Is that learning? Well, there are many opinions about it. People say, well, they're just reading stuff off the internet. But as I said, it took me... 10 years to figure out how they were reading only the right things of the internet and leaving out the other stuff. If it's one child, it doesn't work that way. He can get led astray by the internet. But if it's a group of children, they have a capability to self-correct. And I couldn't understand this until fairly recently when I'm kind of forced to say that what we are looking at here is some kind of spontaneous order coming out of a chaotic situation. Uh, that's not at all common in education, but it is common inside certain areas of economics, of physics and chemistry. Nature itself is self-organizing. It produces spontaneously ordered things out of chaos. Um, what I think we found is a way to do that with learning inside a school. Teachers all around the world are trying it. All of them find this surprising spontaneous order everywhere, every continent. And none of us as yet know what exactly to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do with a group of nine-year-olds that are able to answer GCSE A-level questions? I mean, on the one hand, you could say that they don't really understand, but we don't have any definition of what that really understand means. We have the exam and we have an examiner who corrects the paper. If he corrects the paper and says this is right, then it's assumed that whoever said that uh, knew what the answer was or knew how to work it out. In this case, it's a group. So what does one do? Can you give a, a score to a group of children? Um, I again turn to nature to try and answer that question. Um, if you said, can bees make a hexagon? The answer is no. 
a single bee is stupid, doesn't know anything about anything. But you take about 10,000 of them and they build these perfect hexagons. So if that was a GCSE question, you would give them an A++. So um, have we got something wrong with individual evaluation? Should we look, re-look at the whole idea of, um, can, you, can you do something by yourselves? Selves, not yourself. Because I suppose uh, we're not really alone, are we? I mean, we've got, we've got you know, seven billion of us. Mm. So uh, maybe it's time to, to look away from individual assessment to something completely different. Uh, well, it makes me think of uh, Ken Robinson. He does a, a, a nice talk uh, where he talks about um, if, if you get information from somebody uh, in an exam, you're, it's called cheating. Outside of school, it's called collaboration. Yes. So, uh, Absolutely. And uh, in an office, it would be called sharing. If you didn't do it, you would be considered a pretty wicked fellow if you didn't share what you found <laughs> so, to, so that other people could use it to solve problems. So um, after 12 years of schooling, you go out into a world where you're told to do the opposite of what you were taught in school, uh, which is don't look left and right, don't talk to other people, uh, do things on paper and pencil using your head and nothing else. So um, if you go to a supermarket and you buy something worth 69 pounds and have to pay a 20% VAT on it, or let's say, let's make it more difficult, you have to pay 12.4% VAT on it. All of us have been taught how to do that with paper and pencil. I wonder if there's anybody in the British Isles who does it that way. <laughs> so, so what was that drilling for? Yeah. yeah. Is, how, how much do your thoughts extend to uh, adults then? Is, do you feel that there, there's similarities in, uh, in adult populations? Well, um, there are similarities, but it's covered with years, decades of conditioning. Uh, conditioning which repeatedly stresses the fact that you should do things by, you should know how to do things by yourself. Uh, you should follow instructions. You shouldn't ask too many questions. Uh, that's not efficient. Uh, we're taught that. And it has, I think it has essentially a military past. Um, until quite recently, most of the world was actually run by large empires that needed the military to, to, to uh, sort of maintain law and order. Um, uh, they did a very efficient job, but they didn't have any machines. So they had to create these human machines to do that. What's happened is that we left with that legacy. And when you say, how would adults relate to this? Adults don't understand this. If you say, you know, here's a computer, here's the internet, there's four or five of you. Why don't you just figure it out? <laughs> uh, the adult reaction is, why don't you tell us if you know the answer? Oh, oh. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, opening out learning communities and opportunities in the community context. I, I find that using the technology that's already out there, for example, council-run computers in the library, it's very hard, uh, hard to uh, teach, to share, to, to do a lot of things on it. Um, do you think it, it, it would be a worthwhile uh, thing to remove these restrictions on publicly owned technologies? Yes, the key words being publicly owned and publicly visible technology. So what I've learned in all these 15 years is a very valuable lesson that if a screen is large and publicly visible, then you don't need much control. The control comes from society. Cool. So uh, it's only when the screens become private and small that you have a whole bunch of problems. So I think particularly for children, it's worth every parent's while to think about what, not about how much access to give, but on what? If it was a 42-inch TV in the living room, 
I would give them open internet access. Brilliant. Um, I, I'm interested to know of your personal experience of education. You know, as, as you've grown as, as a human. Well, I mean, it's, uh, I, I attended a very traditional school, basically a Jesuit school. So very much the, uh, the, the military kind of model, uh, you know, discipline and this and that. Um, I, I'm really fond of my school, actually. I look back very fondly at my school years and everything. Yeah. Uh, but it only strengthens my argument that it, it's a good system. So we shouldn't say that it's a broken system. It's an obsolete system. You know, if, if, if you brought in a, a lovely looking Victoria, I don't think anybody even knows what, what that means nowadays. But a Victoria in Calcutta in the 19th century was a large horse drawn carriage, a beautiful one. Okay, you could bring it in and everybody would still consider it very beautiful, but they would say it's not very practical. If you had to go to the railway station in it, uh, it wouldn't quite work. Yeah. So that's the problem with the education system. Not, not that it is bad. It is done with a lot of thought, thousands of years of practice, of development, of evolution. But uh, in the face of the information infrastructure of today, it has suddenly become obsolete. I'm, I'd like to know some of your thoughts on how we can uh, value people and group learning situations outside of formal settings. There's, there seems to be a, a, a bit of confusion around this in, within the formal, formal institutions that we know and love. Yes, I think the, the formal institutions are actually quite confused about uh, what to do with this. We all recognize the fact that uh, people, particularly children, uh, learn continuously from devices. We know it. We don't like to believe it. We, we would prefer to say they waste their time. But that's not true, actually. They learn continuously from each other, from the internet, from all sorts of things. Um, children don't ask their parents or their teachers questions as much as they used to before because they asked their machines first. Um, I saw this in a, in a newspaper report recently that children don't ask questions, they, they look up the internet. Um, now is that good or bad? It's different. So given that situation, if the internet is capable of instructing, then what should a university do? Does it mean that we, we should just get rid of all the teachers? No. The teachers need to learn how to do different things. The teachers need to know how to do different things. Um, not instruct. So what happens to a piece of instruction is that you simply tell the students, go and figure this one out. Uh, so it might make the teacher's role seem redundant, but that's not true. Because when you say go and figure this out, that this is decided by the teacher from his own subject knowledge. So the teacher's job becomes to point to the big questions, the big issues, not to tell you how they work, but to just point them out that that's a big issue. So why don't you come back and tell me what you think ought to be done? It sounds like a very much uh, more social dynamic. It is, uh, it is very social. It's also very Socratic in its own way, which kind of makes me feel nostalgic that that uh, poor man, if he had the internet, <laughs> he, he would have revolutionized uh, teaching and learning uh, by now. But he didn't. And um, as a result, he was poisoned <laughs> because people <laughs> thought it was not the right thing to do. Uh, what did he do? He used to just ask the students, uh, you know, what do you think? Uh, we don't do that anymore. Yeah, I, I hear this uh, this conversation argument between uh, whether ed, uh, education should be skills based or facts based, and uh, is it is is it a false dichotomy to you? Uh, no, I think there's some truth to it. I think there are two pieces to education. The first piece is to understand the world, to understand the nature of things, and the second piece is to be able to do something productive so that you can live. 
both pieces need to have equal standing. Unfortunately, we don't have a world like that. And again, it's because of our recent past. The recent past had hierarchies of people. So the workers needed skills. They didn't need to know how the universe works. The chaps who would enjoy the fruits of the labor, they need to understand how the universe works so that, you know, they can write poetry about it or something. Uh, that layering created a problem with the education system, which persists until today. I mean, if I had to put it uh, rather in a larger than life way, I would say you go to school um, for 12 years, you're taught about the basics of how things work, why the world is the way it is, etc. Physics, and chemistry and science and art, and etc. Then you come out of school and the first thing you try for is, or your parents would like you to try for is the university because they want you to win the Nobel Prize. Um, after a few months when they realize that you are not going to win the Nobel Prize, then they say, well, um, in that case, you better do a BA or something. Um, then you try and if you can't get through the competitive examination process of getting into the really good colleges, then your parents say, well, you couldn't get, you couldn't get a Nobel Prize, you couldn't get into Oxford, so maybe you should get into little Hick College down the road. So, and then you try there and if you simply cannot get in even there, then your parents finally with disgust will tell you, I think you better become a plumber. So, <laughs> Plumbers are extremely important people. I mean, I mean, ask me, I, I, I've suffered from plumbing <laughs> problems. <laughs> so why, why is understanding uh, quantum mechanics considered different from understanding plumbing? Why is there a hierarchy that if you can't understand that, then eventually you better do this. Uh, there's something wrong with that. Maybe we need to reverse it. Maybe we start with skill education. Teach children a few basic skills that will help them one day if they couldn't make it to something really great and then go on to, 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 to more philosophical education, to tertiary education, to, to whatever, rather than doing it the other way about. So um, I've, I'm quite interested in exploring that further. I don't know if, it, if I'm right, but uh, I think it's worth thinking about. Yeah. I, I perceive that our society and societies in general are becoming more specialized and, and bureaucratic in their nature. Um, do, you, do you find the, the bureaucracies you encounter facilitate your work? or um, what, what are your thoughts? And um, I, I don't know if, if bureaucratic is the right way to describe what's happening to society. I think... Uh, society is going through this phase where uh, a lot of jobs are getting done by machines and, and more and more will. And we kind of struggle with uh, what's going to happen uh, to the rest of us uh, if all of those little jobs, if everything's being done by machines. Uh, we are confused. So... We had the automobile and we had a host of, we have social systems for it. We have roads, we have signs, we have motor driving schools, we have um, licensing procedures, all of that. From next year, cars are going to start driving themselves. So what does that do? Does it knock off jobs? It doesn't knock off jobs. It knocks off an idea. There will be a generation of children who will ask their grandparents, what does driving mean? Because they would not know what driving a car means. Because, you know, cars just go from one place to another by themselves. Yeah. So, when a concept goes, it confuses society. What happens to all of those structures? Licenses. Who's going to license? License what? Do you license a machine? <laughs> what do you do? Uh, do you change the stop signs? Because it doesn't have to be written in any language anymore. Uh, what do you do? So, and it's not just happening to cars, it's, it's going to happen to a whole host of professions. It's going to happen to professions which we consider as uh, the top of the professional ladders. Let's say a heart bypass surgery. 
I can quite easily think of a day, maybe as little as 50 years from now, when a patient will say, are you, if the nurse says, oh, by the way, uh, our uh, robots are all occupied, so we've got the best heart surgeon in town to come and do your surgery. And the patient would say, do you mean to say that you're going to let a human being touch me? Sorry, I want another hospital. It's just the reverse of what it is today. Today you would have said, I don't want a machine, you know, and it, but it doesn't take much to change it. And it's happened to many, many different uh, aspects of our lives. And uh, we, we learn to live with it. But uh, we still have this confusion between man and machine and uh, what that is going to do to us. I, I know myself, I, I've, I've got uh, apprehensions about finding out about the, the there are now um, algorithms reading CVs rather than human beings. Yes. Uh, and uh, very capable people are not, not even being considered to do very human jobs. So, yeah. Yes, yes. So, uh, and, and reading a CV would have been considered a very human uh, thing to do. <laughs> So, um, so it, 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 you know, there are a whole range of things uh, that are going to be affected in this way. And uh, of course, the big question is, where is it going to leave us, uh, humans? Um, I, I, don't have, I don't have an answer to that, but, but we are adaptable. I think we'll survive. <laughs> and I'd love to know what you enjoy most about uh, Education, being in education and teaching. Well, what, what's your driving motive there? Mainly to observe the process of where somebody didn't know something and then after a while he knows it. Um, I think that process needs to be better understood so that we can get to a world where you can no by demand. If, I'll, I'll try to explain that, that. What about a world where instead of having your head full of things for 12 or 15 years and then re you're being released into the world so that you can live using that. What about a world where you say, um, I, need to, I need to know how to fix a fuel injection system in a particular brand of French car, I need to know this for the next one hour. And something makes you know it for an hour. It's knowing by demand. Maybe you pay for it for an hour, <laughs> you pay for it for two hours. And then at the end of that period, you don't know it anymore. I don't see why we shouldn't think about it. Not, not yeah. whether we should desire it or not, but uh, I think we should ask ourselves, uh, why can't that be true? Going back to some of your work where you've taken uh, computers into places that, that, that didn't have access to them, uh, I'm curious what, what, what technology did you actually use at the time? At the time, whatever I had really, uh, we had desktop PCs. So uh, I had to use desktop PCs. Um, I used a glass, uh, I used an opening in the wall covered with glass, pretty thick glass, so you can't break it easily. You stick the monitor behind it. Monitors were big in those days, CRTs. And uh, put the CPU on the other side and then brick it up. So it basically like an ATM machine really. And um, uh, electricity, when I had it, if I didn't, if I could generate it um, with uh, petrol, and if I couldn't, then uh, with solar, which was very expensive. It's a lot cheaper now. The internet was always wired in those days. There was no wireless. Now it's a lot easier because of wireless. But uh, having said that, it's a lot easier because of wireless, but it's also a lot uh, less, um, what should I say, um, a lot less dependable. Uh, a wired connection, once it worked, it worked. But the wireless connections, you know, the bandwidth goes up and down and, and children hate that. Every now and then they say it's too slow or it's stopped altogether and, and that kind of thing. So I hope that gets better with time. I, I'd, I'd like to uh, try and 
tackle some of the, the access to, to technology issues here in Edinburgh. And um, I, I'm keen on, on the developments that are coming out of Linux. Um, do you see these, like, so there's, there's key pods and there, there are these, uh, these whole operating systems that run off of USB sticks. Do you see these as... as uh, you know, uh, computing systems and computing environments, uh, they, they evolve like almost anything else. So, uh, so if you look at what's happening to the operating system, you can see its evolution following almost similar patterns to nature actually, to the gigantic dinosaur-like huge systems breaking up into little components uh, interacting with each other. Uh, going further down into independent operating systems, like you said, the ones which can reside on a memory stick. And uh, eventually, I think we'll have uh, a host of, of operating systems. I think depending on your access device, uh, and not even perhaps under your control, your accessing device will decide what OS is needed for how long, what it's going to cost you, from where it's going to get it. And I think it will all come off the wireless infrastructure eventually. Well, uh, this has been fascinating. Um, I'd like to finish off with, if there's one thing that people listen to this and walk away with, what, what would you like people to walk away with in the, their minds? What idea? Well, um, I think you can change the entire existing education system with four words. First of all, you have to take any examination question and uh, prefix it with my four magic words. So if an examination question says, solve the following simultaneous equation, my four magic words are, use the internet to. <laughs> if you did that to an examination, if your teachers knew that every question was going to say, use the internet too, and then ask the question, she would teach differently. The fellow who sets the question papers, he would set them differently. The curriculum would have to readjust completely. The pedagogic methods have to readjust totally. The parents, instead of being afraid of their children accessing the internet, will come to school and say, better teach them quickly how to do lots of complicated things with the internet. You need four words. So, so for your viewers, use the internet to colon. Thank you very much, Sukhata. Really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs>